Well, General Magic uh, came to live in uh, Arden Street in 1948. And that was just at the stage where I was uh, a very efficient paper boy, delivering the papers in Arden Street and around that area. Now, I can't remember if I delivered, actually, the Magic's paper, because I was doing a lot of um, main door for flats and also the stairs. And it was a big bundle of papers. But I, I did meet him on, on several occasions. Because sometimes he'd be outside in the front, um, front garden there. But I never imagined that he was the great general magic, because it didn't mean anything to me at that time. And it was only years later that I discovered who general magic was. And that, that was a great revelation. Outside, because it didn't mean anything to me. Flat in Arden Street, Edinburgh, of General Stanislav Matrek, and on the wall of the house, there is a plaque to the general, commander of the First Polish Armour Division. It states that he lived in this house from 1948 until his death in 1994. This plaque is the only publicly visible recognition of him in Scotland. You know, as often as you go through life. You speak to people and you, you don't really know who they are. And then all of a sudden, uh, it may be through a death or a presentation or something, you suddenly realise what a wonderful work they've done. The general was known to his troops as Batsa, or Chief Shepherd, for the care he took with their lives. It was said of him that he never lost a battle. A disciplinarian, a plain and straightforward communicator, he treated his soldiers fairly and equally. He was stripped of his Polish citizenship by the communist government in Warsaw in 1946. He was known to some customers at the Lermont Hotel in Edinburgh, where he worked after the war as a barman, as Stan. He took a special interest in Polish war disabled ex-servicemen in Scotland. On his 100th birthday, he received good wishes from a number of world leaders. He was promoted to full general by President Wałęsa. Described by the then Pope John Paul II during his 1982 visit to Britain as a piece of history. Urodziłem się 31 marca 1892 roku pod Lwowem, a na lata gimnazjalne spędziłem w Zagłębiu Naftowym w Duchobyczu by po maturze w 1910 jako student filozofii i polonistyki wejść w bujne literacko i politycznie życie młodzieży w Lwowie. Pod koniec studiów należałem do Związku Szczyleckiego i tylko przed wczesną mobilizacją do armii austriackiej na południe z powodu wybuchu wojny z Serbią oderwała mnie od możliwości służenia w regionach Marszałka Piłsudskiego. His military career began in 1914 and was to span some 34 years. At the beginning of World War I, he saw service in the Austrian army. In 1918, he joined the Polish army and took part in the Polish-Ukrainian war and then in the war against Soviet Russia. There followed 18 years of peacetime soldiering in a number of different posts and he steadily progressed in experience and rank. In 1928, he married Sofia Kouris, and she was eventually to bear him three children. As a parent, my father never really showed anxiety about what I should learn. He wanted me to live and to learn by myself. But he was always there when I needed him. Well, I met the general, of course, uh, at the very beginning, when he was commanding our armoured division, at the very beginning, but I was then uh, officer cadet. Meeting a general, but the officer cadet is uh, one side only friendship. In other words, I was standing to attention and, and, and <laughs> hoping to be noticed. <laughs> so uh, that was my first. I mean, I, the general, general was very popular amongst us from the very beginning. I don't remember which was the first time. One of, one of those inspection in Scotland, I, I think, uh, I've seen him. 
um, he was very popular among us because he was very friendly to everybody. The last symbolic act of the departing Polish soldiers off the brigade from Douglas was to present a large memorial pillar to the village. When the pillar was handed over to representatives of the village, General Matrek said, The true friendship which united here on your native soil, the noble Scottish people with us, the representatives of the Polish nation, will last forever. Before leaving, on order of the military authorities, this so extremely hospitable town of Douglas, we are handing over and asking you to receive this monument as a symbol of our friendship. May this monument always remind you that you have in the 10th Cavalry Brigade most sincere and faithful friends. Long live His Majesty the King, long live the great Scottish people. My memories of the war years are rather fading these days because um, I was two years old when it started and I was eight when it ended um, and one doesn't remember everything. The thing I remember mainly about those times was the visits of Lvovska Fala to the house where my parents lived. All of them came in, in coaches and, and, and I remember great tureens of, of uh, Bigos and Flaki heating on the Aga stove. I can remember the singing and, and the real happiness that existed when uh, all the Polish artists came. Uh, and uh, it was something very special uh, because it was a recreation of Lwów in Scotland near Forfa. I remember too how father used to take me into the woods to collect wild mushrooms, which we then cooked and ate much to the horror of our Scottish neighbours who thought we'd all be killing ourselves. Colonel Harold Mitchell, MP, a British liaison officer with the division, speaking in the House of Commons on the 29th September 1944, said, In those areas of Belgium and Holland, which I have recently visited, I found the Poles and the people of the liberated towns and villages getting on extremely well together. It was an amazing experience to enter places in both countries and see what joy the Poles brought by their victory. I saw people standing in the doorways of their homes, damaged only perhaps an hour before in the fighting, throwing flowers and handing fruit to the troops and cheering themselves hoarse. The general and liberating towns always sought to minimise the damage caused, something much appreciated by its citizens. Pod bredą my stali jakieś sześć tygodni. Przyszła Holenderka i domaczka prosić go, żeby nie zniszczył miasta, żeby tylko z ręczną bronią na, i zgodził się. I nie było w, w ogóle zniszczeń. Było tam pewne zniszczenia, ale bardzo mało. I mu, Niemcy musieli uciekać. Już po kilku godzinach walki przerywamy się przez obronę niemiecką i przecinamy zasadniczą oś dla Niemców, oś Tilburg Breda, uzyskując pełną swobodę manewru. Mimo rozpaczliwej obrony niemieckiej przeciw natarcia dwoma pułkami na nasze zewnętrzne północne skrzydło już od świtu 29 października oddziały i od południa i od północy walczą na skrajach miasta, a do nocy miasto zupełnie opanowują. Wśród tłumów wiwatujących Holendrów Z ukrycia wychodzi dawny burmistrz miasta von Stolbe i wśród rosnącego entuzjazmu ludności wprowadzam go na stolec burmistrzowski. Preda, ich ukochane miasto nie zostało zniszczone, że dzięki szybkości działania i manewrowi dywizji 
niemal nietknięty zostaje oswobodzony. April 1945 saw the beginning of the last stages of the fighting when the division advanced into Germany and took the surrender of the port of Wilhelmshaven. But General <coughs> knew what he wanted. He was, uh, uh, he could be quite fierce and, and uh, the, his decisions were, when they were made, they were made in a very forceful way. Not in a way they, not in, 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 in his forceful language, because he never swore or anything like that. But it was a statement to obey. Undoubtedly, he was a leader, but he always led from the front. After Yalta, he knew that he would never return to his homeland. And yet, he and his soldiers went on fighting. If there's a lesson to be learned from this, is that true honor is perhaps the most important thing and it must never be self-serving. Potem nastąpiły walki o dostęp do twierdzy i kolebki marynarki wojennej niemieckiej Wilhelmshaven, tym cięższe, że teren w ogromnych zalewach utrudniał postęp. I gdy dywizja stanęła przed ostatnim pierścieniem obrony tej twierdzy, the final rundown of the resettlement corps in Scotland was virtually completed by August 1948. On 10 September 1948, the 56-year-old general service as a commander in Scotland ended. A point often heard from Polish ex-combatants was resentment that General Matryk was never given a military pension by the British. Documents of Mr. Attlee's Labour administration indicate it was felt that there was a case for granting pensions to certain senior Polish generals, who, because of their age, would find it difficult to obtain any sort of employment. After the war, there was nothing. And he took the job in the co-op in Gifford, and then later on he, he took a job as a, as a barman in in one of his more canny soldiers' um, um, establishments. The Dobbs had done quite well and got himself a bar, but he employed his former general. And I, I remember being told that this, the former sold, other former soldiers would come in and, and ask for a double whiskey and salute the general <laughs> as, they, as, they, as they did so. But he never, he never complained about that, and he never, he never in any way self piteous he just got on, got on with his life. I jednego dnia będąc generałem, następnego dnia będąc barmanem i to u swojego żołnierza, jakież to musiało być smutne i, i bolesne. Mimo to on nie dał poznał po sobie. Ja mam żonę, mam troje dzieci, ja muszę im dać utrzymanie, muszę pracować, żadna praca nie hańbi. Ja myślę sobie, Boże kochany, cóż to za człowiek, wyjątkowy. If asked what my father's major uh, good points were, I feel I have to answer that in Polish. Inteligencja, wrażliwość, współczucie, Cierpliwość i zrozumienie. Ale dla mnie, że był moim tatem. General Maciek's case was singled out in particular. It was felt that he had most loyally handled the problem of the resettlement of Poles in Scotland and the final wind-up of the Polish commitment in Scottish command. In addition, he fought most gallantly through the 44-45 campaign. It was noted that he has no money of his own and has a wife and two children to educate, as well as maintain a disabled child, and was anxious to know whether any provision would be made for him. He had also, by joining the Corps, been deprived of his Polish citizenship. Well, General Maciek was, of course, uh, very disappointed and, 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 and rather uh, hurt, very badly hurt by this decision. He wasn't the only one, of course. Uh, there were several 
uh, important personalities in the West, which were uh, deprived the of the Polish citizenship. Of course, Gen General Anders, uh, General Kopański, uh, who was the chief of general staff, uh, and high, all, many other high-ranking officers. So it was not against General Maciek personally, it was a whole group which uh, the Polish government, the communist government, uh, accused them of, accused the older generals to join the Polish resettlement corps. After the war, he made a number of visits abroad to honour his fallen soldiers. His memoirs, From Horse-Drawn Wagon to Tank, were published in Edinburgh in 1961. In September 1981, he unveiled a special memorial at Duns in Berwickshire to the fallen of the 1st and 2nd Armoured Regiments of his division. Basically, I think my father really loved Scotland, and I think he was very happy to stay there and uh, to keep out of the politics that went on in London or elsewhere. On every side, um, there seemed to have been great affection as well as great admiration for an excellent general, but real, real love for him. And I think he was called the shepherd, wasn't he? And then, it was brought home to me very much um, when General Bortnowski, who was in charge of the former Maciek regiments, as you might call them, in Zhagan at the Jan Sobieski barracks, when he came over with a group from, of, of the twinning, uh, twinning arrangement, <clears throat> and he was very anxious to meet the general. It wasn't sure that General Maciek would be <clears throat> fit enough, well enough, to receive visitors. But we were to ring up on the, on the Sunday morning. So we were all set to go, and we rang up, and yes, we could go. So I drove the general and his, and his wife in, and we went to the flat in Arden Street. And I remember there were two wheelchairs in the hallway, one for general and one for Marga, his amazing, wonderful, disabled daughter, highly intelligent, wonderful person, but very disabled, two wheelchairs there. And the general was sitting there, and um, I, was, I was much touched because he, he, he kissed my hand, and I thought it was old general kissing my hand in a beautiful, courteous way. And then General Bortnowski was introduced to him, and General Bortnowski knelt at his feet and wept. I think it's very important. I mean, I think it's important not only for the young Polish community, but for the young Scottish community to realise that uh, he was an exceptional general who lived in their midst and uh, who was treated very badly by our own government. We him such an exceptional man. You know, to actually have gone from general of an armoured division to actually working in a, a bar in Edinburgh. I mean, can you imagine the people sitting in the bar, you know, saying to him, oh, what did you do during the war then? Eh? <laughs> and he would say, well, <laughs> I, I'm sure he wouldn't say, well, I was the general of the famous Polish Armoured Division. They'd say, aye, 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 you know. But here he was, you know. He'd become Scottish. The first spotkanie moje było z generałem, to przyjechałem tutaj w 58. 
roku i to było gdzieś tak właśnie zaraz po przyjeździe. Tato mi mówi, słuchaj, to jest nasz generał, pamiętaj. I naprawdę to był tak sympatyczny pan, taki dystyngowny i tak świetnie się, fizycznie się trzymał. Naprawdę było widać, że to jest zawodowy, wojskowy, z, z zawodu i z serca. Szalenie miły pan. I pa, w ogóle cała ta rodzina, pa, pani Maczkowa, którą miałam kilka razy spotkania w, w ramieniach Związku Polek, prawda, myśmy cały kontakt miały, miałyśmy wspólnych przyjaciół, obydwoje Moje państwo byli, tacy, jak pani Irena Thornton raz określiła, ja powiem to po angielsku. Um, you know, Iza, when I go to General Marczek house and Mrs. Marczek, I feel I am really in Christian house. Mnie to tak zastanowiło, mówi, they're so lovely, how, are we, how they, look, they look after the the youngest daughter, which is an invalid, an invalid chair. You could see that the, the dedicated par parents. On, czyli jego, jego żona przychodziła do mnie, e, dwie córki. I e, co, co było najbardziej, e, jak co, co mnie, mnie się podobało bardzo, że on, on sam przynosił swoją córkę na rękach, bo ona była kleką do, do, do mnie, do, 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 do zębów, do liczenia zębów. I jeszcze pamiętam jedno, takie było bardzo, to, to było wzruszające. Jak generał miał stuletnią rocznicę urodzin, było przepiękne, wystawne, że tak powiem, przyjęcie w Cathedral Hall. Zjechali się z Holandii i Lord Lord Provoz i, i cała rodzina, ale generał wolał pozostać w, w domu. Ale myśmy wszyscy tam byli, reprezentowała go żona, dzie, córka, syn i tak dalej. Było nabożeństwo oczywiście, ale później podjechaliśmy pod jego dom, żołnierze i to był nasz pierwszy um, polski konsul generalny, doktor Paweł Dobrowolski. I nasz pierwszy, naszej wolnej ojczyzny, niepodległej, e, ambasador de Viron. I wszyscyśmy tam razem podjechali i zaczęliśmy śpiewać, no, pani, e, oczywiście ambasador i tam delegacja wyszła do środka, myśmy na zewnątrz stali razem z żołnierzami, ja też tam się gdzieś <śmiech> plątałam, <śmiech> bo chciałam jeszcze raz zobaczyć, że to taki dzielny, dobry człowiek. Każda chwila z takim człowiekiem to jest radość, że już... E, i pamiętam, on wyszedł, myśmy mu śpiewali 100 lat, 100 lat, a on wyszedł i mówi, proszę, Proszę was, 100 lat to jeszcze za mało. Ja chcę trochę więcej. To było kapitalne, naprawdę. What else can I say about my father? Uh, well, basically that he was a family man, that from a position of leadership, he was not afraid to get his hands dirty and he took whatever job was necessary to keep his family together. That is what I respect him for most. In March 2013 in Edinburgh, the Right Honourable, the Lord Fraser of Carmyle, a prominent figure in Scottish public life, officially launched a campaign to erect a memorial in Edinburgh near to where General Matrick lived. Lord Fraser was personally prepared to spearhead a campaign to see that, as he said at the launch, that the UK and Scotland in particular owe a great debt of gratitude to the great General Matrick, and our lack of acknowledgement of him over nearly 60 years has not been honourable. Lord Fraser wished to see that the injustice of not recognising the contribution that General Matrick had made in the last war to the Allied cause should be permanently recognised in his adopted city of Edinburgh. Tragically and suddenly, in June 2013, Lord Fraser died and his plans to lead the campaign he was unable to see through to its completion. However, there are plans to re-energise this campaign as it is strongly felt that a debt is owed to the General and that this should be marked with the erection of this memorial. The sad and untimely death of Lord Fraser seemed to stall the campaign and perhaps finish it altogether. 
Uh, now that I hear that it is being revitalized, I am delighted. I feel nothing but sheer joy. We all miss him. We all miss him, those who are still alive, and not many of us are. As a great commander, a great friend. <laughs>